Welcome to Whitley Bay, one of Northern England's most beloved seaside resorts. Located on the sun-drenched North Sea coast, just about 10 miles northeast of the great city of Newcastle. Day trippers flock not only from Newcastle, but across the region to this gorgeous part of the coast, best known for the spectacular beach that stretches for two miles all the way from St Mary's Lighthouse in the far distance. Whitley Bay's beach is the perfect setting for a spot of sunbathing, swimming or strolling along the sand, and on this walk around the town we'll take a stroll along the magnificent new promenade en route to the town centre, but not before we pass by Whitley Bay's biggest attraction. Ahead of us in white is the Spanish city, the icon of the seaside resort of Whitley Bay. With a history dating back to 1910, the Spanish city has been the centre of seaside entertainment in town for decades, and while it has indeed had a fair few ups and downs over the years, it remains a must-visit spot in Whitley Bay over a hundred years after it first opened. Just out in front of the Spanish city, meanwhile, we're passing by Whitley Bay's cenotaph. This grand monument was erected in 1922 in memory of the locals who lost their lives in both world wars, and it stands proudly here by the seaside at the edge of town. We'll venture into the centre of Whitley Bay in a little while, but let's now return our focus to the town's main seaside landmark, the spectacular Spanish city. A striking European-style building that dominates the waterfront here, when the building opened in 1910, it was designed to act as the northeast answer to Blackpool's Pleasure Beach, home to a lavish entertainment complex that would draw in visitors from all over the region. In its early days, the Spanish city was home to a concert hall, a restaurant, shops, a roof garden and more, while it was neighboured by the huge Pleasure Gardens funfair, filled with roller coasters, a ferris wheel, arcades and all the trappings of a classic seaside resort. Now with the popularity of British seaside holidays at its peak in the early 20th century, the Spanish city was one of the country's most visited destinations, drawing in hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. However, as was the case with so many resorts across the country, the post-war era saw the Spanish city decline in popularity, as many people began to holiday abroad in places like, well, Spanish cities. The allure of foreign holidays left the Spanish city neglected, with the building and its funfair becoming mostly derelict by the turn of the millennium. And while the Pleasure Gardens funfair was demolished in 1999, thanks to some fantastic work by the local council in recent years, the Spanish city triumphantly reopened in 2018, with this Whitley Bay icon once again home to restaurants, tea rooms, shops and even room for stage shows too meaning that there's once again more than enough to enjoy on a trip to Whitley Bay. And nowadays, the beautifully refurbished Spanish city sits right at the heart of Whitley Bay's impressively regenerated seafront, a real delight to explore on a sunny summer's afternoon like this. So as we now make our way away from Whitley Bay's most iconic attraction, we'll now take a walk down the promenade and take in some of the sea views. As we mentioned, this area by the coast had fallen into relative disrepair as recently as 20 years ago, but the successful regeneration of this long, wide open promenade, combined with the opening of more new shops and restaurants, has made this once again a thriving, lively place to be. However, as well as adapting its famous seafront for the 21st century, Whitley Bay's regeneration also seeks to capture the spirit of the resort's heyday. But as we look out over the beach and the glimmering North Sea, why exactly was it that Whitley Bay became so popular? Well, along with its gorgeous beach and sea views, proximity to the well-established industrial city of Newcastle also played into the town's boom in popularity in the early 20th century. As you can see from this map, we're just a stone's throw away from central Newcastle, and just a few miles north of the mouth of the mighty River Tyne. Of course, with the rise of Newcastle in the industrial era, thousands of workers moved into the city to work in its shipyards, mills and factories. And with so many more people in the city looking for a relaxing day away from work, the demand for seaside holidays grew exponentially, with Whitley Bay a prime destination for Geordies alongside the likes of South Shields, Colourcoats and Tynemouth. But the emergence of Whitley Bay as a beloved seaside resort isn't quite that simple 
as this too was once an industrial town in its own right. Historically part of the county of Northumberland, Whitley Bay sits on the southern edge of the vast Northumberland coalfield, and so at the height of the Industrial Revolution, coal mining was actually the main industry here, with the materials extracted from the ground here, then transported to major ports like Blythe to the north, for export further afield. Now owing to the significant natural deposits beneath the ground, coal mining had been carried out in Whitley Bay from as long ago as the late 17th century and its main colliery was reopened in 1810. However, while coal mining was the main business here for a number of decades, the industry in Whitley Bay never matched the likes of major regional mining towns like Ashington and Bedlington. And as such, the historic Whitley Colliery was closed down in 1880 due to unprofitability, bringing mining in the town to a relatively premature end but this opened the doors for new holiday businesses to set up shop. The town quickly became a magnet for visitors, bolstered in particular by the opening of the North Tyne Loop Railway in 1882, which is now part of the Metro, and which gave easy access to the seaside here for the thousands living in and around Newcastle. As we know, Whitley Bay's popularity soared after the turn of the 20th century, with the opening of the Spanish City and Pleasure Gardens Fun Fair, and, along with the appeal of its beach, the town became a firm favourite, prompting ever more hotels like many of the buildings opposite us here on the promenade to open and cater to the booming tourist trade. Nowadays, while some remain in operation, many of Whitley Bay's traditional hotels have fallen out of favour, particularly after the opening of a large chain hotel right beside the Spanish city, though the buildings that line the seafront remain a part of the town's ongoing restoration. Further up the promenade, we'll pass by the former Rex Hotel, once upon a time one of the grandest lodgings on Whitley Bay's seafront. But as we continue along the promenade overlooking the beach, the sands of Whitley Bay have a number of interesting sights of their own. A little further down the coast from here towards the neighbouring town of Cullercoats, you'll find a once beloved seaside spot. Now while the spectacular beach at Whitley Bay stretches for two miles along the coast, you'll notice that it comes to a rather abrupt end here, replaced by some fairly steep cliffs, at the foot of which is Table Rocks, a famous natural rock pool that became a big tourist attraction in the town's heyday. Frequented by visitors taking a dip in the bracing waters of the North Sea, the natural rock pool was so popular that it was actually expanded in 1909 by the local tourist board to create a 70 foot long swimming pool which, as you can see from this tourist advert from the 1920s, was always a lively place, and a must visit for many on a day out in Whitley Bay. Of course, as Whitley Bay fell in popularity after the Second World War, the old rock pool too was neglected, and it's no longer visited by tourists. But the two miles of sand beneath us here are more than enough to accommodate the modern influx of summer visitors. In fact, Whitley Bay's beach is longer than either of the main beaches at Scarborough further down the coast, and so it's easy to see why it has remained so popular through the years. And while the town isn't as big as the likes of Scarborough or Blackpool, Whitley Bay is still by many counts the largest seaside resort in North East England, with a local population of over 40,000 people, making this one of the biggest coastal towns north of the River Tyne. Having made our way along the coast all the way from the Spanish city, here at the end of the main promenade we can see Grant's Clock, a modest local clock tower that was placed here in 1933 at one end of Whitley Bay's Mammoth Beach, and it serves as a sister to the historic St Mary's Lighthouse, which marks the other end of the beach, two miles north of where we are now. Grant's Clock takes its name from a local councillor of the time when it was erected, and it stands over the point where Whitley Bay Beach comes to a rather abrupt end, with cliffs replacing sand beneath the promenade here. Meanwhile, up at the other end of the beach, there stands the clock's sister in St Mary's Lighthouse, built on a tiny tidal island back in 1898, which we can just about see in the far distance. Interestingly though, it's thought that a lighthouse of some form has been positioned there since as far back as the 11th century, when a small lantern tower belonging to a local monastery stood just north of modern-day Whitley Bay. But now, having walked by the seaside for a good few minutes, 
let's make our way inland to the heart of Whitley Bay, past many of its hotels. As we mentioned earlier, the promenade here is home to a part of the former Rex Hotel, which is currently being refurbished and is set to be converted into a care home in future. The original hotel, named the Waverley, was opened on the waterfront back in 1906, and it actually began life as a small temperance hotel, which served no alcohol. Despite this, the hotel quickly became a thriving seaside spot, and expanded in size into neighbouring buildings on the promenade, becoming one of the largest hotels in the region with 150 rooms. In 1937, a few decades on from its opening as the Waverley, the hotel finally gained an alcohol licence, and then took on the new name, the Rex Hotel, which over the decades became a major social hub in Whitley Bay, particularly around its classic nightclub, The Deep. Now The Deep was once upon a time the main nightclub in Whitley Bay, and it grew in size following on from an old folk club, which had played host to many famous names, including the likes of comedian Billy Connolly, singers Jerry Rafferty and Ralph McTell, and Geordie rock band Lindisfarne. The Rex Hotel remained open throughout Whitley Bay's period of decline in the second half of the 20th century, until it finally closed down in 2016. But of course, as we can see from many of the buildings around us here on the South Parade, the town is full of hotels even away from the seafront, many of which are locally owned. But as we now climb up towards the centre of town and the main road, it's about time that we looked back even further in history, to the earliest origins of Whitley Bay, long before it became a bustling seaside resort. What is now, as we mentioned, a rather sizeable town, actually started life as a small possession of the important Tynemouth Priory to the south. Back in the medieval era, Tynemouth was one of the most important monasteries in England north of the Tyne, boasting significant wealth and vast areas of land nearby. Now settlement was scarce on that land at the time, particularly by the coast here, but the first community of note came in the form of the village of Monk Seaton, a small sea town belonging to the monks of Tynemouth. Monk Seaton is today a part of the modern town of Whitley Bay, located a little further inland and even playing host to its own station on the Tyne and Weir Metro. But what of Whitley Bay itself? How did this coastal settlement come to be its own town independent of the ownership of Tynemouth Priory? And what's the history of its now iconic name? Well, Whitley Bay is mentioned as a separate settlement to Monk Seaton for the first time as far back as the 12th century, known by the name Whitley at the time. But in the medieval era, there still wasn't much here by the coast, with only a lighthouse and a large manor house owned by one Gilbert de Whitley to be found. Interestingly, however, Whitley's manor house was likely heavily fortified, as this part of England was regularly subject to devastating raids by the Scots, who would maraud down from the north with wealthy locales like Tynemouth in their sights. As we pass by the brewery pub where the South Parade meets the end of the town's main street, the manor house here seemed to survive most of the Scottish onslaughts, and it changed hands over the centuries between various wealthy families. From the Normans in Gilbert de Whitley to the regionally famous Percy family, and later the Duke of Somerset, the manor was for a long time a valuable possession, with the main house rebuilt a number of times over the centuries, the last being the Duke of Northumberland's Whitley Hall, whose grounds existed roughly where the Spanish city and cenotaph are today. The hall was demolished in 1902 to make way for the Spanish city, but ever since the earliest origins of the manor here, one thing had remained consistent, that this place was known as Whitley and only Whitley. How did Whitley come to be known as Whitley Bay? Well, we'll talk more about the rather surprising reason why in a few moments. Here though, we're passing by the Grand Victoria Pub, the largest pub in Whitley Bay today, located right at the heart of town. Back in the early 19th century, prior to the influx of tourism, there were just two pubs in Whitley, but today you'll find far more on the town streets, along with many more interesting buildings that flew up as the resort grew in popularity. Beside the Victoria behind the lorry here is the imposing New Coliseum, once upon a time a theatre and cinema that opened back in 1910, and operated until it was closed down in the 1970s, though despite being converted into shops, its impressive old frontage remains. 
Now as we continue along Whitley Road here, let's return to the story of how this town came to be known as Whitley Bay. Simply put, the name change came about as a result of a case of mistaken identity. With Whitley becoming a major seaside resort around the turn of the 20th century, it regularly became confused with the Yorkshire seaside town of Whitby, with Whitley here receiving a lot of wrong mail. The mail was a bit of a nuisance, but according to local legend, the final straw apparently came in the early 1900s, when a dead body was sent to Whitley, as he was meant to be buried down in Whitby. Having had enough of all these mix-ups, the townsfolk of Whitley decided to change the name to Whitley Bay, which also emphasised its picturesque seaside connections. And for the past 120 years, the name has stuck nicely. But speaking of interesting local names, on our right across this busy junction, we can see a pub by the name of the Fat Ox, named after a famous local resident. That resident was quite literally a massive cow, which grazed on the lands of the manor at Whitley in the late 18th century, and was notable right across northeast England for its immense size. This drawing from 1789 depicts the Fat Ox itself, which was said to weigh around 216 stone, or 1,372 kilograms, and stood a whopping 5 foot 9, or 1.75 meters tall. Here now, we've arrived at the last landmark on our walk, St Paul's Church, built here in 1864 at an important turning point in the history of Whitley Bay, as local industry made way for the resort that we know and love today. So as we take in the tranquil surroundings of St Paul's Churchyard at the heart of this bustling seaside town, that brings us to the end of our walk for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you're now looking forward to your own day out in Whitley Bay sometime soon.